So my average salary, once they no longer let me do that, my average salary is going to drop <coughs> way down because I'm including those lower cost people in that allotment that I did not pay from that allotment last year. And I have to do that in order to use the money at all because they aren't letting me transfer it to use it for somewhere else. So my average salary is much lower than it was last year, and that's where that $4 million comes from. So is any of that to do with the fact that maybe you had a lot of people retire with the higher salary? And that's how you I, I think not, not for the current year. I think it's more simply that if you look at the, the number of positions that I was able to transfer out last year, versus the restriction this year. I just had to pay more people out of that allotment and pay lower cost ones out of that allotment, which lowers my average. And But the average they budgeted it at is the same average as was actual last year. And there's no way we could have hired more people. No, that no, the dollars are really irrelevant on position allotments. The only thing they look at is days employed. And like in, in 2009-10 when I overspent it by a million dollars, I wasn't in any trouble because, you know, I left a half a day on the table. You know, out of the 10,000 days that our allotment was, I left a half a day on the table. So I didn't overuse the allotment. It was just they weren't expecting our teachers to cost so much because I moved everybody out who was paid less than the average cent. They essentially didn't let me transfer it anywhere but teacher assistants. And teacher assistants, you can only transfer to teachers. So, you know, given that we were already using those allotments for those two things anyway, it didn't give me much of anywhere to go. The only thing I could transfer out was instructional support positions, you know, which I did. But I meant every single teacher, basically, that had been state paid in the past still had to be state paid. I couldn't do the switcheroo like I did the year before. So my average was much lower. I may need to create a little scenario with <laughs> numbers like, you know, a thousand dollar salary so you can, you know, see. But, I mean, mathematically, I, I hope you all understand how it works. I love math. Not everybody does. Mary, the basic premise for moving and doing all that is to stretch the dollars. Absolutely. Stretch the right. Absolutely. Because the, the first year, like I said, I moved all the position allotments out to something else, and then I paid the lower paid teachers with dollars because, well, since they're not letting me do it anyway, I'm not sharing any secrets that I shouldn't be sharing. But, but the average teacher allotment, let's say, was $50,000, you know, including benefits and everything else. The cost of a beginning teacher with benefits and everything else was $35,000. Every position I transferred out, I got the $35,000 to spend in another category, and then I paid all my teachers out of federal money I paid 15000 for each position I did that with. Right. You know, and I mean, it added up to several million dollars. Sure. Well, then once I couldn't do that anymore, you, you can understand how the average salary goes down, right. and I can no longer leverage that extra several million dollars. And be, in between that, I had prepared this little chart to show you that over the three-year period, there is a $5.8 million swing just in those four position right. allotments in terms of what I was able to utilize because they keep restricting the rules. And some of it had to do with the federal dollars that you had, too. Well, that's true, but um, the um, one of the reasons that I, I paid teachers out of the stabilization funds was because with the state rules, of, which I think came from the Fed, they counted exactly as the state position. So as far as principal pay and everything else, workers' comp, all that stuff, the state covered that, so there was absolutely no disadvantage to moving a teacher out of a state paid position and putting her up on the stabilization fund. Now, the edu jobs money that we have now, rules aren't the same. That's just like any other federal dollar, and if I were paying teachers out of there, they wouldn't count toward the principal salary or anything else. So I'm paid mainly non certified positions out of that. I mean, with the combination of not being able to move the teacher positions out and also there being some disadvantages to using federal funds to pay teachers versus non-certified employees. Any other questions? Yeah, I just want to go back to the fact that, you know, such an amendment never had anything to do with the health of this and you understand the work, you know, the health of the
guess to sum it up, Ms. Parker, you've done such a good job that caught on at the state. Well, what's going on? There. It, I mean, it wasn't all my idea, like I, I, but I did talk to, to Hank <laughs> and, and Ricky, and also um, Terry Crutchfield and Winston Channel. They tend to get together and brainstorm. Well, thank you for stretching our dollars and all that we can. We'll have to do everything we can. Um, all right, so if there's no other questions or comments, uh, all in favor of the budget amendment number nine, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Okay. Moving on to the interim budget for next year. Um, do I have a motion to uh, approve the interim budget for 2012-2013? So moved. Is there a second? Oh. Second. Seconded by Mr. Fletch. All right. Questions or comments? And I'll just say before we start, you know, uh, basically without an interim budget, nothing goes on Monday. Oh, no, without an interim budget, the gate is closed and locked and no employees report right, exactly. because we have no authority <laughs> to do anything. And so basically this is a, a partial budget to get us through until we get everything from the state, BPI, and everyone involved in our budget process, uh, which would normally... Uh, I believe we approve our formal budget in years past in November. Uh, but, uh, That's where I was estimating again this year. Okay, so you think it'll probably be about the same? I, I would hope so. I mean, I would think the, the General Assembly either tries to override the veto or, or goes home. And, you know, I hope by the end of July we have an issue a lot. Of it. It, we're kind of in uncharted territory right now on this. so. Um, you know, if the allotments drag out longer, it could be longer, but I'd, I'd anticipate the November board meeting right okay. now would be when we have a Okay. Any other questions or comments? Um, I know our, our uh, we can't take our expenses and divide them by 12 and come up with a, a monthly tax expense. It doesn't work that way. But I was curious why um, this is it's a five-month budget and you divide it in. Because we paid the local supplement in November, and that affects the federal funds. Uh, there are a lot of employees who still have that as long term payment, and that affects child nutrition fund five. It affects so the we, federal grant fund fund eight. So the answer to that is we have more expenses in the first five months than we did. Well, you, you have lower, obviously, in July and August because teachers aren't working and aren't getting paid, but November can be really, really high. Um, so, uh, I mean, in my assessment, those five months equal about half the, the mm -hmm. year for all the funds except state. The state, the reason it's so high is we tell schools, you know, order your supplies now. Right. They're for this year's kids. And there is a huge amount of state spending that goes on in September, you know, with the start of school. So that was why I didn't just do 512. That really wouldn't have been enough. I mean, I was assuming the, that was the Yeah, issue. but no, that... Given the, our payment of the local supplement in November and the fact there's this huge surge at the, the start of school in non-personnel purchases, a half a year is about what it equals by the end of November. And I wanted to thank you for answering some of the questions I sent in advance uh, related to the budget resolution. Um, I'm still uh, not sure I'm clear on the fact that you know, some teachers are paid out of local money. so. This raise goes into effect a 1.2% increase. Uh, where is that money for the raise? Uh, is all the money coming out of our own pot for these raises? Is the state funding those state teachers? No, state I, again, teachers? I had a good rehearsal trying to explain this to, <laughs> to Julie Ball and, and why um, a raise that affects base salary um, is much more costly to us than a one time bonus. Um, what the state does when they give a, a raise that's too base salary like this, they look at the position allotments they will cover. Because like I said, on the position allotments, the dollars are just an estimate to give them some kind of idea what they, they spend. It really doesn't control our use of it at all. It's all strictly days employed, down to the half day. On the dollar allotments, though, they look at it on a statewide basis. They collect the data from all the LEAs, put it all together, and say, okay, overall, 80% of this allotment is personnel. So if we take 
1.2% times the total allotment and then take 80% of that, that's what the salary raise should be, and that's what they put in the allotment. Now, when it comes down to the individual LEA level, within that allotment, it means some LEAs get more money than it actually costs for the raises, and some get less. And what it tends to be is larger and, in a way, wealthier units, because we have a lot of local support, tend to get less than what it really costs to cover the raise. The reason for that is because if, if you're a poorer and smaller unit, because the, the formulas are oriented toward giving the smaller units more money, they usually have a base and then there's an ADM component on top of that, they are probably buying things out of that allotment as well as paying people. And that's particularly true of poorer units because they don't have local money as an option to go to for other things. So their mix is much less labor intensive than in a larger unit that has a lot of local support because, you know, Finance Officer 101, you know you always want to pay a person out of state money versus buy a thing because when you pay a person out of state money, the state pays their workers' comp, it pays their disability if they're injured, it pays their longevity, it pays their annual leave and terminal payments things like that, you get a, a lot of add-ons when you pay somebody out of state. When you buy a thing out of state, all you get is what it costs. So what we all try to do is to put all our people on state and buy our things out of local. So it probably means I'm going to end up short on the position allotments which really of really covering the raise. And I'm probably going to have to move some people that I paid out of state this year onto local as a result. So that's, that's one effect of this. If it were a one-time payment, that would not happen. Because when there's a one-time payment, what the state usually does is creates another PRC, and you just charge the bonus payments there. It's never budgeted. It's never allotted. They just cover it, just like they cover longevity pay for state paid workers. So there's no issue of does the state money cover the state raise or not. It just automatically does. So. I, I probably am going to end up with some spillover from state just because those allotments typically for us won't cover the raise. But then it affects the local supplement. Um, the local supplement is a percentage of base salary and out of local funds we have to pay the local supplement for all state paid employees. So that local supplement that I paid for the state paid workers this year is going to go up by 1.2%. <coughs> then for my local employees, I've got to cover their 1.2% raise also. So that's the way it affects local. Um, in terms of your question about teachers, I realized um, after I sent it that I, I left out a component that I've, I've mentioned already the restrictions in the ABC transfer process caused me to pay more teachers out of state last year than I did the, the year before. But I did also for one month to use up the um, stabilization funds, pay some teachers out of that. So there's actually about another 1.2 million that we spent on teachers that normally would have been paid out of local. So it's been about four million total that I would have normally paid out of local that I instead paid out of state and federal during the current year. All right. Any other questions? All right. All in favor of the interim budget resolution for 2012-13, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Aye. Okay, moving on next on the next agenda is the personnel report. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel report? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, Ms. Jackson, if you would let the record reflect that Mr. Bryant will be abstaining from voting on the Irwin High School math division. One of them. One of them. Oh, one of the Irwin High School math <coughs> Alright, questions? policy for hiring the most highly qualified applicant. Um, I don't feel I can be assured that this has been the case. Um, recently we had 112 people apply for 13 principalships, which on average is 8.5 applicants uh, per position, which uh, to me is not a large enough pool uh, to get diversity, uh, to get the most uh, talented people that we want for our kids. So I have those concerns. 
All in favor of the personnel report? Can I ask a question? Yes. Dr. Bowman, is that? It's my understanding that we advertise the principal's position. We advertise for a principal for the system. <coughs> we don't. Well, the, the only the only difference this year is we did because of the uniqueness of community high school. We did a turnaround model. We did actually pull that after the initial advertisement for, as you say, for a general principalship, not identifying the schools, we did pull to identify maybe more specifics in that in that job and identify the school. Correct. Right. That's right. But it's also really not correct to say that we had 13 vacancies because we moved people. Mm -hmm. I mean, we ended up having what? Four. Just to come in, I had the pleasure of going to that, that administrative retreat this week, and I was sitting at the table, and um, I just asked the question, how you know, how does it happen to school, and they, every you know, principal, every principal, and all of them said it's the best we've ever seen, it's the hot, most number I've ever seen. Just to, from their perspective. For teaching position. Yeah, just from that point, what you're saying, you're saying principals, but in general, they said over the last time that they were the principal, and they were involved in these schools, they didn't want applicants down there. Well, could I share, we shared the day you weren't there, uh, Thursday, we shared, we did a personnel report for the principals. We have a record number of applicants. Mm -hmm. We have, since we went to HRMS in about 2005, 2006, we've been able to keep up with that number and we have averaged between eight and 9,000 a year. We already are at 10,000 and we're not only halfway through the year. We had, in one week, we had 1,200 applicants. Uh, and our system um, will, eliminate duplicates and so those are not duplicate numbers. We have twelve hundred people hit apply on our system. So not for all positions certainly. I mean I can't say that, but for many of our positions we are very applicant very well. Yeah, I think it would be probably good if the board wants to do this that we could look at some of that data as far as, you know, there's certain schools maybe that people aren't applying for, you know, if we can, can see how that uh, I know other systems have used ways to address that problem where they're not getting enough applicants at certain schools or for certain types of positions. Uh, but just having that kind of data would be helpful. Just a thought on that, not to speak to my stuff. But it just seems like that's micromanaging that maybe the way our principal is having a problem. Administration leadership sees that and they point out that the board should be involved at that level. Well, that's my question. Thank you. Well, I've, I've been kind of lenient, but we're dealing with a personnel report. We're not dealing with our hiring procedures today. All in favor of the personnel report, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Okay. Um, and Ms. You're keeping me as an abstain from one yes, sir. with my daughter. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. All right. I'm going to go back to, to the last board meeting when it was 11 o'clock and I was cross-eyed. But uh, we uh, had a vote on uh, board member request for information about the procedure and Dr. Baldwin and our attorneys have, have talked about this and so I'm going to turn it over to them and let them know. Can we, uh, this actual motion, again, that was passed, could read that. Close it. Motion was made by Mr. Bryant that all requests for individual board members from individual board members for information reports from any staff, local county school system, including writing, and the superintendent There you go. There you go. Board chair. Yes, sir. Mr. Campbell? I'm aware of the address the issue. Uh, I listened very carefully to that motion. I'll just say to the entire board that, in my opinion, I think it's important to clarify motion is not about whether or not information is provided or not provided. Um, I think there's considerable proof that um, we do provide information as requested by both the entire board and individual board members. I think that information is, uh, is very detailed and comprehensive as much as possible within reasonable bounds. Uh, and I thought, also believe that it's provided in a reasonable time period. Um, where I believe the issue uh, 
flies is in how it's provided. In other words, the structure and the timeline for response. I will say that I believe very strongly that for the efficiency and the effectiveness of our organization, I realize we're a large system, we're the largest, largest school system in the state. And it's very important that board requests, whether again it's from the entire <coughs> board, whether it's two, three board members, or individual board members, that that request come directly to the superintendent. Um, I say that not because you don't have to work with me long enough to know that I don't have a huge ego. I don't. I left that behind the coaching business. But I do believe, again, from an efficiency and effectiveness standpoint, and then it becomes my responsibility, once I receive that request directly to me, to determine who in our school system is the best resource to assist me in giving you that information. You know, whether it be Ms. Parker in finance, whether it be Ms. Lopez in personnel, whether it be uh, Mrs. Seller, our uh, Sellers, our elementary education coordinator. Um, and then, at that point in time, once I identify those resources to the best of my ability, <coughs> I'm going to put that information together and provide it to you, again, in a reasonable time period. Um, there's another reason, too, that I think is very important, and again, you all know that I do this, and I try to do it on a very, very consistent basis. If, for example, Mr. Craig sends a request for information into me, I will not only send that information back to him, but I make a point to copy the entire board. Now, why do I do that? Because, again, if that information that he's requesting, I think, could be very relevant for Lisa. And in many cases, parents are asking her the same question, or Mr. Bryant. Uh, so, uh, again, it's very important that it comes directly to me. Um, now, I know I had that, you know, that was an issue that came up. and uh, So I asked our leadership team, I said, I want you to tell me, you know, is there an email that has come? And, and I'm saying this as a board. I understand. I'm saying the entire board. I'm not pointing out any individual board member. But I, but I, I, I got back from one staff member this many emails and requests for information that came directly to them that I wasn't talking about. And, and again, it's the efficiency and the effectiveness. Now, you know, our team members know that if a request comes in from an individual board member, entire board, or multiple board members, they know if they don't see that I'm involved with it to take, bring it to me so that it's coordinated. But that's an additional effort. And, and again, uh, I, I believe very strongly perception becomes reality, and, and I, I don't think it's the right thing to do to put an individual team member up here in the central office or even or in the school in that position about, you know, the, the, the fear I have is that they feel let's drop everything and I need to respond to that sort of thing. And so, you know, I, that, that's the first thing I would say. And that, that's just in general. And that, that would apply to the entire board to multiple board members requesting the same thing or individual I want to reference the timeline and the structure because I think that's where the rubber hits the road. Um, and I'm going to give you again just an example, the most the most recent example at the June 7th board meeting. Um, you know, well under 48 hours before that closed session starts. And we usually start closed session between 5 and 5 30, so that's just the time reference. Well under 48 hours, I had a minimum of six requests for information that came, came in. Uh, some came directly to me, others involved additional staff. 
Um, now, when that happens, because I understand, you know, you, you will have some questions with information that's coming out. If, it, if it's a question that you know, I can easily access, I can go to Cynthia's office and say, you know, this question came up, can you help me with this? Then what I've tried to do, and I think all of you have noticed, is when it comes to superintendent comments, I try to get that information out because, again, that's an opportunity for me to provide it to the entire board well as to me if it's individual if it's two or three that's asking questions um, but again that time crunch and, and I know one of the emails re requested some pretty extensive information and when it comes in that close to the board meeting I think the perception is legitimate that well, we got to get this information before the board meeting starts. And so what can happen, depending upon the degree of information that has to be researched, it can take, let's say it's finance, it, it can take Mrs. Parker multiple hours. Uh, and, and let me tell you, I, we, we love Ms. Parker, but you know, if I go down there and ask her for, for an <laughs> answer to a question, you're going to get, you can take her answer and you could go out and publish a book on it. I mean, it, she is the expert on it and she is very detailed and she explains it to the nth degree. And I think that's an incredible quality. Thank goodness for our school system that we have that type of person. But it takes time because the, as an encyclopedia of finance that she is, when you're asking for specific information, she's got to go back in and research. I think everybody can understand that. In any case, Ms. Parker can't do it herself. She has to bring, it could be something to bring in Mr. Social and Capital Outfit. And I'm not saying that, it, again, it's not, if it's not legitimate information to request. Don't, don't get me wrong. But again, it's that timeline and it's that feeling of, we got to get it, get it done. I know I use the word, I use the word respect. I probably use the word disrespect. <coughs> uh, I explained it to this board earlier. I, I, I try to operate for everyone, everyone. Everybody walks in my door. I try to be very respectful. For whatever reason they come in from, whatever line of employment, from the child nutrition worker to Suzanne Swanger comes to my door. But, but I do think that it really is all under the umbrella of respect. I don't say that as a personal attack on anybody, but I, I think it is a respect issue on two camps. And the first is just the respect for what each and every person that works in this building and works in our 42 schools, their charge is to educate children and the demands on them, each and every one of them, just the daily operations of the school. And I think that's that's a respect. As important as the information is, and understand what I said and preface this whole thing, it's not about getting the information or, or not getting the information. The information is going to be there. But in this case, it's that, it's, that, it's that timeline and that structure. And the second area of, of respect uh, maybe I, I do have some rabbit ears on. Been in athletic business, you know what rabbit ears are, don't you? Okay. If you've ever been an official, you know what rabbit ears are. If you've ever been a, a parent spectator at an athletic event, you call referees. A lot of times you say they have rabbit ears. There's no sense to it, right? Maybe I am. But I live on a daily basis running this organization here in Central Office. That we have one of the biggest central offices in the state. If you don't believe me, go look at that. We're six less leadership positions in the central office than we were for you. So I know what I've done as superintendent to maintain the good work. I've gone down to Cynthia Lopez, who is our personnel director, who's as good as I've ever, ever worked around. You know what I've told her? I'm putting something else on your plate because I know that you have an interest in global education. 
Well, our personnel director right now is in charge of our global education. And you all know how important to me that is. So I had to have someone that I know was going to take it go with me. But it's not just her. I can go through this whole building, and that's exactly what I've done. So, yeah, you know, when, when it's coming in, I, I've got to make sure to protect that it's not it's not an overload on them because of the tremendous amount of responsibility they have just the daily operation to get things done. So, um, I, I just, I just feel like that. So, I'm just speaking from the heart. Chris, down. So, what uh, Dr. Baldwin and I did was we met, and he basically told me exactly what he just told all of you. So, in knowing that the motion has been passed by a majority of the board and it needed to be tweaked, I took his comments and I put them into a framework that I thought might would work because obviously the application of a process is always the difficult part is how are you going to apply that process. As I go through these, keep two examples in mind, two easy examples. I think it always helps to frame the discussion. Take a request right before a board meeting for the um, school violence report from the previous year. Single document submitted to the state. It is a matter of pushing a button and emailing it to somebody, okay? Then take a board member who says, I am interested, whether it's before the board meeting or not, I, an individual board member, I'm interested in us outsourcing our transportation department. I think that we should hire a private company to operate all our buses and transport all our students. I would like for you in the transportation department to compile a report for me of the annual costs for transportation so that we as a board, and I as a board member can see in the open market what would it cost to operate a transportation system versus what we're paying now. So those are not documents that are in existence. Those are not subject to the public records law. A member of the public, you know, can come in and say, I'd like this document or that document. A member of the public can't say, I'd like you to do a report. Well, the board should be able and is able to dictate to the staff and superintendent to do reports and to analyze things and compile things and put them together. But I think everyone sees the point. It's not answering questions. It's a process for answering questions. Because what if two of you or three of you want the superintendent and finance officer or the transportation department to engage in a study that in good faith is going to take 30, 40, 50 hours to pull information together? Well, in our democracy, if the majority of the board wants that, then the staff will do it. But if the majority of the board doesn't want it, there's no obligation to spend 30, 40 hours on something. And then everything in between. I've given you two examples. But we all know that the requests usually fall somewhere between those two examples that I've just given you. So keep that in mind as I work through these. So taking what Dr. Baldwin told me and what he told you folks, what I crafted would be an amendment to the motion that was passed at the last board meeting. Again, we have told all of you that no, and it's in this amendment, but I'll say it again. No action of this board will do anything regarding the public records law and the right of you as citizens to come to the superintendent and say, I want a public record. Nothing would ever inhibit that, and it clearly says that in this. So here are the revisions, and I'll work through them. The motion to amend would be, number one, that all board member requests for information from school staff must be directed to the superintendent. Requests shall not be directed to other staff. That's his request that you funnel it through the superintendent. He's just giving you the reasons of making sure the right people answer it, getting responses to all of you, and getting the information back to you. Number two, the superintendent must make discretionary decisions on how to extend staff time and resources, and he may refer the board member back to the chair to discuss the request further. So it's an out for the superintendent. Before I have my staff engage in something that is going to take 30 hours of, of man hours to compile and produce, is that something that the board wants to be done? Is that a direction the board is going in? If it's not, then the superintendent can say to any of you, that's not something that's currently on our plate. That would take a lot of staff time and resources. I'm going to refer you back to the chair. And as you know, we have a process if a board member wants the staff to look into something that can be brought to the full board, and then the full board decides. I hope we can all agree as rational people that before the administration would undertake a 30 or 40 hour study on transportation costs for the purpose of outsourcing transportation, that would be something a majority of the board would want the staff to look at. Otherwise, they're spending the time that you and the taxpayers have otherwise paid them to do doing other things that are requested at that point. 
So that is available to the superintendent. Again, your ethics statement says that you delegate to the superintendent and his staff the running of the school district. And folks, I think we know the tension is always going to be, is a board member acting like the superintendent or wanting to be a superintendent too much? Or is the board member advocating policy? And each of you can disagree, issue by issue, as to whether the actions of a board member are getting into running the school system or an issue of policy. All this says is that if a majority of you have not asked the superintendent to do it and he believes it's going to take too much time, he can refer you back to the chair and you can have very pleasant discussion and then bring it to the full board as needed. So it's just an out to the superintendent. Number three, any request to the superintendent for information that comes 48 hours, and that was what Dr. Baldwin wanted, 48 hours, prior to a board meeting must simply be copied to the chair for review and consultation with the superintendent regarding a response as needed. Take my two examples. It is two hours before a board meeting. You ask the superintendent for a copy of the violence report, you copy the chair, superintendent shoots it to you in an email. Doesn't even call the chair, doesn't bother with it. And that's what Tony Ball has done and will continue to do with your request. However, if you are asking for data and it's going to take six or seven hours to pull it together, is that something that the staff has time to do on the eve of a board meeting, or within 48 hours of a board meeting? It gives the superintendent somebody by your procedure protocol to call, and that's the chair, and say, I've got this request. Here's what it's going to take. What do you think? The two can discuss it. And then that chair is the person dealing with the board member, which I think is appropriate. Y'all should deal with each other on issues in the chair or the superintendent to call the board member back and go, no problem, answer's coming, or what you've asked involves three different people and three different reports. Dr. Baldwin's happy to do it, but you're going to get an answer probably Monday. There's no way the staff can pull that together before the board meeting. Fair enough. Again, it's a process. It's not dealing with what's being asked for. And then number four, what I said earlier, this procedure does not alter the responsibilities of the superintendent as records custodian under the public records law. This policy also does not affect your ability to ask questions and engage in discussions during board meetings. It uh, doesn't affect that at all. This is request to the superintendent. Email request in this modern age is how that is done primarily. Um, other telephone calls, things, but this is how the procedure is done for request for that doesn't affect your right to ask questions or anything of that nature. So that was my attempt to take what he's told you and kind of put it as a modification to the previous one. So that's interesting. I mean, you just received uh, budget amendment nine within 48 hours. How can I hang and ask any questions about it? No, ma'am, let, me, well, let me repeat that. Mm -hmm. no, it's a good question. Is it okay to discuss it now? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm finished. Um, that's a great question. No, the, what this says is that if it is within 48 hours and you have a question about it, Simply copy the chair. You're fine to call the superintendent. You're fine to email the superintendent. As long as if you do a written request, you just copy the chair. That that's it's just a procedure. Superintendent will then deal with you if he can give you the information immediately. But if he feels like it's an issue that is more time-consuming than you may realize or whatnot, he has the ability to call the chair, discuss it with the chair, and then do a response. He doesn't have to. He's not out. This doesn't change the way he's been operating whatsoever. What it says to you board members, and that's probably the best way to do this, what does this policy do to you as board members? What this procedure, and I'm also suggesting you give this a try, and then let's see how this works. We're pretty good at this in six months, but it's not working. If you've got a request for information, go through him. That's all it means. If it's within 48 hours of a board meeting and you want questions answered, data compiled, just copy the chair so that the chair also knows in case the chair and the superintendent want to discuss. That's all it means. It is not a prohibition on getting answers at any time to anything. Because you can't. And I think we can all agree as rational adults, there's no way you can draft a policy that would address all the nuances of requests for information that could come to a superintendent or a staff at any time. It's not an attempt to do that. What is different? I mean, the protocol I've discussed with Dr. Baldwin is that I, he's always copied on my emails or else I send it to him uh, when I have a question for a member. Um, I don't know what precipitated the motion in the first place. Uh, maybe somebody can shed some light, Mr. Bryant, you know, why the motion was even made to begin with. Yeah, at this point, that procedure would be appropriate. This would be a motion second, and then you can continue discussion. 
Would anyone like to make the motion that we adopt these procedures? I'd like to make the motion that we adopt the procedures outlined in this chart. Right, as an amendment. I'll, I'll, as an I'll amendment. Second it. Okay, all right. I just thought we should get a motion and a second before we discuss the students further. I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. Bryant. Uh, the, the reason for my motion was not to, uh, nor does it say, to take away from anything that involves freedom of information. It doesn't say that. Nor did it say anything about asking questions during a board meeting. My motion was in reference just to what he's talked about here tonight. And what jumped at me, and I had been thinking about it, was at 7.37 or 6.37, the night before the board meeting, the long request of Ms. Parker to answer all those questions as related to the budget amendment at the last board meeting was made after work hours the night before the board meeting. In my opinion, and apparently in the opinion of most of the board, that was inappropriate. It's too close to time. They are hired to do a job. Part of that involves providing information for us. But the taxpayers of Bunker County are paying them to do a job. When it takes the amount of hours that it takes from Eric Parker or Ms. Lopez or whomever it happens to be, <coughs> excuse me, on a short turnaround like that, I just don't think that's appropriate. I don't think that's proper protocol. That's why I make the motion. Not to, dis not to ever stop quality, productive, debate or discussion in a board meeting for quality productive questions during the board meeting. It doesn't say that, nor did I intend that, and I thought we discussed that when we had when the motion was made in the second year before we voted on it. That's the reason I made the motion. Well, wouldn't it seem that I was giving her some advance notice on the questions on the budget amendment rather than waiting to the meeting to ask those same questions? As I read it, you were asking for compilation of data and a report. Her response that she got back to you in the email at very helpful, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, the day of the board meeting, sometime late that afternoon, was given back to you in that manner. Now, that may not have been what you intended, and it may not have been what her thought process was, but as I looked at it, that's what happened. It was, an, it was a request for a compilation of not existing. There was, how many people had to be involved? Four people involved. How many hours is that? Um, Two, four, six? No, it was, it was Okay. In my opinion, that's not a good expense of taxpayer dollar at that point. I'm not, I have no problem with the request. Let's just do it at a time where they've got a fair amount of time to put that information together for you, for Mr. Craig, for Ms. Franklin, for me, or whomever it happens to be. Uh, that's my point. Not, not to take away from the request. Clarify, it was only to ask questions about the budget amendment so that I would have enough information to vote, to make an informed decision when I was voting. Well, the budget amendment was online on, help me, Ms. Jackson, Thursday. Friday night by 5 o'clock right. before the next Thursday board meeting. That's the rule for Wednesday. And I think we've had a call. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. Possibly we had a lot of stuff to vote on. A lot of information to read. And part of the process to me, I mean, and I supported his motion, was that it was simply somebody, we don't, Mary Parker, I mean, I guess, injured indirectly reports to us, but there's a report structure. And I think if I was Mary Parker and I got a request from a board member, it would carry a lot of weight and be like, dang, I gotta drop everything and do this. Whereas if it goes to the superintendent, or originally we're gonna go to the board, but I like the idea of it going to the superintendent, you can look at that and determine how you know the, the, the amount of time and it follows the proper structure. And I think that's I mean so that's why I'm support would support the motion. Well, I think it's also important that, I mean, there have been emails that have been sent out where uh, board members have asked for the compilation of, of materials that are not readily available and would take a considerable amount of time uh, for the staff, uh, you know, to put all that information together. And if we're, if, if that's something the board needs to make a decision on, not an individual board member, as to whether we want that compiled in that manner or not. And so it's important that it go through the superintendent. Um, and I will say that for the most part, everyone, everyone on the board is pretty good about copying me on a lot of things that they do. Um, and I think it's important as a general rule to really try to copy all board members. You know, anytime, just to, because a lot of times some of the questions that come up may be, you, you 
you may have the same question. So, uh, and, and I have to jump in and say, and you all know what I'm going to say. So I respond. Do not <laughs> right. engage. Do not engage in debate <laughs> over email. Right. Um, I haven't considered. There's no cases on it, but I think everybody sees the concern that the open meeting floor wants you to do this. Well, and, and I would say that email can be this board is, is pretty good. I mean, uh, uh, Mr. Sizemore has warned me a couple of times, so maybe I was getting too close to that. But, <laughs> but for the most part, the board is good about not debating via email, and, and, and that's, that's good. But uh, I just think, and like I say, it was 11 o'clock. I was about cross-eyed by the time this came up. You know, if, if, if the perception was that we were trying to stop information, I apologize. That was not the intent of anything that I said in the meeting in regards to your motion. Uh, I think that uh, you know we have a very open process. I think it's just a matter of making sure, especially with the number of, of positions that we have lost in the central office uh, and around our, our school system, that we do it in a orderly, efficient manner as to how the information <coughs> is, is going about. And if we want to spend the time to get that information pulled together. Uh, but as far as any um, public information, state uh, information that's available, I mean, we can't stop. We don't have the, the authority to stop any of that information. Uh, right. 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 So, uh, anyway, any other questions or comments? Well, I have some more comments and questions. Um, I, I'm very concerned. I think private citizens could ask, let's say, for example, the sellers. Go and ask for questions. Is that correct? If they wanted information about early elementary curriculum or education, they can ask for that down in their office. They can ask for that phone. They can ask for in the grocery store. Why but as a school board member, I can't do that. I have to go through a gatekeeper. I have to go through the superintendent to ask the sellers. I have to ask him, and he's going to go ask the sellers to respond to my request. That's what this is all about. And then you're going to throw in another gatekeeper, and I've got to go to the board chair. If it's less than 48 hours, if we pass this amendment, um, you know, he's got to be a, a It was just a team. copy of the email. Well, well, in the original motion, you're the Well, we're talking board. about the amendment now, <laughs> right? So, um, and I do know, even in Buncombe County, that Wanda Green, who's the financial officer of the county, was sued because she was acting as a gatekeeper of information, and, that, and she lost the lawsuit. The citizens won. Uh, so this is the same situation where we are instituting a gatekeeper, um, you know, and the, the previous procedure I thought was working was fine. You know, I did not mind copying Dr. Baldwin when I had questions with staff, and he agreed with that. He said that was fine. Um, has that always been done? You've got a file there that you well, said it's not that you know, again. Uh, Maybe we can pass that you're, around. You're, you're asking me. I'd like to Does that mean? Have I done that? Um, you know, we've got situations where it went directly to to staff members, that, that question, and, and I wasn't copying on Could you pass the folder um, around? Like three well, where the problem arises is when, you know, when information, when a member of the staff is asked to compile information, and then if they don't respond in a timely manner to that, or uh, they get threatened uh, with their job, that's that's a problem. What kind of threat do you think? Well, you, you said <laughs> there's a copy of an email where... Ms. Parker was told she would be reported to DPI if she didn't compile information in a certain manner. Not what I said. I just said, should I ask Ms. Bill Price, the Chief Financial Officer for DPI, uh, if, if she couldn't provide the information, I thought perhaps he could. Well, why would you think that he could provide that information? Because he's the Chief Financial Officer for DPI. <laughs> and so for he has all, all the Buncombe County information? Yes, perhaps, I would think. Perhaps? He would have, I would think he would have that information. At least I could ask. I think a reasonable person, and I didn't see that. Uh, it sounds like you did. I, I just from what I hear, I think a reasonable person would infer that that's a threat to someone's position. I would, I would feel that way if, if I were working in a situation where a board member put that into a, whether it be verbally or in an email. I'm not sure how it happened or what was said. I would, I would construe that as a threat.
question, and I'll use the two examples he used. One was very much different than the other. And I, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about uh, the other thing, nor do I think Dr. Paul was talking about that. And you know, I prefaced that early on, and let me just emphasize it one more time. I've had calls from every single one of them, every single one of them. In some cases, some of them more than others. And if it's, a, if it's an answer I can give you, you're going to get that answer. Now, if you're asking me something and I don't know the answer, I'm going to go back and find the right resource because the last thing I want to do is give you inaccurate information. But when that request goes to Ms. Lopez, and even if I'm copied on it, I, I don't have that. I've got to run her down. I, I could be a female elementary school. And, and we've got to do that coordination piece versus it coming to me and then sitting down with her. That, that's, that's where I'm trying to, to show you if we can centralize this. You're going to get your answer. Now, if, if, you, if, you, if you're telling me that you're asking me questions and I'm not giving you answers, I've never heard that from you. Now, is that something that, that we need to have a discussion? In here. Jerry Rice knows what an open door policy I've got. <laughs> Certainly for you know for the board, it's 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 open. We'll talk about that. Well, Mr. Chairman, too, I think you all raised a good point. Many of you, being district reps, have reasons from time to time to talk to principals and hear about things going on. I think that um, an appropriate amendment would be that this relate to central office staff because let's deal with the issue that, from my understanding, and talking to Dr. Baldwin really affects the board is that you're wanting accurate system-wide district level information. So I think an appropriate amendment to this amendment would be that it only relates to central office staff. And then common sense, what Dr. Baldwin can tell principals is, look, answer board members' questions, work with board members as you always have, but just remember that if a board member is asking you to spend time and resources on something, you are to very politely ask them to run it through me. I mean, at some point, it's a procedure, folks. You know, we don't need the Supreme Court to decide this. I think we're, well, I it think sounds to me, so I think that, that would be a good way to do it, is just to change that, um, and then to do that. But this, this procedure um, is put in place, but I would recommend that, that this just apply to central office staff, because I agree. I think from time to time, you'll have a need to talk to principals and others, and I don't want a motion in any way to even be argued with I think it's fascinating. We just passed a four-page budget that's over $250 million. And you you just passed a four-page, four-page or had total for each one of these. Nobody wanted a line-item budget, uh, which is what I've been talking about since I got on the board, um, because that would cost too much work for Ms. Parker to compile. But she already has that information that because she has to do the roll-up for already, each one of these. We've already had that. We've already I'm giving an example right now of not asking Ms. Parker to compile data for us. Now, this is what would come from the board as a whole. It would be a motion I would make. I'd say, I move that the board receives line item detail on the 2012-2013 budget they're voting on, for example. And that, usually when I make motions like that, I don't get a second, or I do, and, and everybody votes no. Uh, because we don't want to cost too much work, or we don't, I don't, you know, these are kind of motions that come from the board as a whole, not an individual. I haven't asked Ms. Parker or anybody to compile data for me in a new format. I merely ask for clarification on things I'm voting for in meetings. So, that's an example. Most of these motions come from the board. But just, the only thing I was going to say is those are easy numbers, as you said, and we've been talking about for quite a while. So it's not like, we haven't talked about these numbers, it's just like, uh, five twelfths or seven, whatever. It's half, that's right. But it's half of the numbers that we've already looked at and we've already mm -hmm. analyzed and that we've already got detail on. In the budget work? No, we haven't gotten detail. We did not we get line item detail. detail no. No. Okay. Well, I will, I will say in response to what you just said, Mr. Chairman, that the email that you were talking about specifically stated that you wanted a different version of the county numbers. I can't recall what you're talking about. The version of what county? Well, the county appropriation when we were voting in May uh, as to 
of what the budget will request. Well, I'll, I'll get a copy. I just asked for clarification because we had a 220 In the email that you sent, Ms. Parker, you specifically asked her to compile you a different budget of the county numbers because you did not want to flip between different documents. Okay. Well, I had asked. Right, because the funds, it's not so a you, So you did ask. You just said that you did not ask, but you I, did. Well, I'm understanding what you're saying. I wanted to know what was in fund two. Okay, so I had to go through this budget handbook. This is not a new compilation that she would have to do. This is a push of a button on a computer to put out, print out what's in fund two. I had to go through this whole book and highlight every time I saw a number two. These are number one. Um, for example, here you can see some of my highlighting. This is from Fund 2, uh, where I highlighted. So I had to go through this book. I mean, can you imagine? I could tear out every page and, and paste them up here to try to see where, you know, the Fund 2 fits in. Um, I, that, to me, is not out of the ordinary to just want the Fund 2 uh, list on, you know, in, on well, however many pieces of paper it takes. But, but it's not an entire book that I had to go through and highlight. Find out what was in the county budget we sent to the commissioner. That should be a board decision, not an individual board member decision. But see, it's already exists, done too. I mean, to me, that is not a new format. This is, I mean, this is already exists. It just pushes the button and says, print out from two. Can I just clarify, it. too, though, to, again, since you know, we have stakeholders in the room, you can clarify that, I think. Reason that we have such a big budget, we're talking about the stuff that is part of that back and put multiple forms of that information out to try to help to find a way that we can better, better easily to access. So there's about five to six different forms of the same information. And, and I talked to a lot of superintendents, and they're one of the rare systems that have gone to that extreme to try to try to put different models out there, the same information. No, this is just where she took the strategic plan and made the budget fit the strategic plan. Because I had said, I would like to see our strategic plan align with our budget. Okay? So after the fact, in January, after we passed the budget back in December of last year, in January, then we get the book to find out what we voted on. Um, then, um, you know, this is a great format. I've appraised it because it does have the strategic priorities and it has the budget aligned with it. However, the way it was developed is questionable because the priorities were put, uh, the numbers were put in there, uh, you know, not in the, they were not developed according to the strategic plan, okay? They were made to fit the strategic plan. That was the problem. Any other questions or comments? Um, I have one more. Comment. I can find it. I might uh, yes, the information I gave you is directly related to this whole issue. Uh, we had a whole session on Wednesday at the North Carolina School Board Association meeting, um, and I put in everybody's gray folder is a list of questions that board members are supposed to ask. Uh, we are supposed to ask for information and for data. And one problem I see that I'm, have, I'm having to ask a lot of questions because I am not getting data in the type of format that I should be getting it as a board member. And I've given you some examples from Wake County. And that's what the large sheet is. Uh, this is only two pages. This is a two pages <laughs> right here. And this gives me a snapshot of every school in our district. Uh, Across the top, you'll see the school system. This is called the, the Healthy Schools Report. This is from Wake County, and this is something they do for over 160 schools. And so since we could simply do this for our 42 schools. Um, and you get the different categories. You can't read. I apologize. I'll tell you what they are. The, the color didn't come out. Uh, performance and academics is your first category. And you can instantly see... Uh, how many kids are proficient on EOG? Uh, what how does this many have schools that expected growth? We're not. We're talking about the amendment on the table right now. The procedure we have to go through to get information. 
And I'm saying it would be not so necessary to ask them any questions if we were getting data in the appropriate budget, format. Budget. That's where I'm and you're distracting us from what the topic is at hand. The topic at hand is we have a motion on the floor in a second about the amendment to what we did before. Is that about correct? quests for right. information. And I'm saying, well, we're not getting uh, we're information in a timely data, a timely Wake manner. County? Let me finish, please. Um, uh, for example, if we're supposed to vote uh, on issues and we don't get that, maybe we need to ask for another amendment to this to say well, we want to receive information from the administration seven days in advance so that we will have time to ask questions and not have to wait 48 hours. Or let's have the, them give us the information we need to make the right decision, to make informed decisions for our constituents, for the children in this county. So there's a whole section of this on student populations, the demographics uh, of the students, the number of AIG kids, the number of special ed kids. Ms. Fowler, I think we, I think, hold on a second. I think we're getting a little bit off the topic. No, with we it. are yes, not. Yes, absolutely we are. It's all this about is, information. I told you that I would give you information, time to talk about this after we finished. But this is, this is the reason this is here is because it's all about. Well, and here again, the, about this is something the fact that, that we're if not we as the a data board we need direct to make the informed decisions, that's why we have to ask so many questions. In your opinion. And here again, as a board, if we vote for the uh, superintendent and his staff, I got it. Yeah. Is he back? Steve? You got to hit the speaker button. Steve? Did you hit the speaker? Are you there? Mr. Sizemore? <laughs> Can I bring it back to the motion um, and kind of summarize? I think that, go ahead and answer that. So, because I think this has been. A Are you very, there? Steve? He's going to have to pick it up and then put it on speaker and put it back in. Yeah, after he's playing the game. Mr. Sizemore? Hang up. To bring it back, to, there's always going to be a tension between what one, two, three, or even four board members would like to see as far as information. And the law is that if one board member wants information in a certain format, there's no obligation for them to get it in that format. If the majority is not in favor of looking at an issue, then the desires of one board member do not result in the administration being required to do But a board member should have information. They should, nobody's right or wrong. Those are opinions. So this motion does one simple thing. It just says if you want the central office to look into something or put something together, you need to go to the superintendent. <coughs> his track record has been that he responds, he responds, he responds. Um, I've, I've all seen right. all of them. Pick it up. Hello. Yes. Come on. You there? Are you there? Hang on. Uh, no. Are you there? Are you still there? Speak a button went off. Well, he's going to do it. That's okay. That's not in the chair. It's Are you there? No, he didn't really mean to. Hold on. <laughs> so, Steve, you get the end of my closing argument. So, I did. so in okay, summary, I will, yes. Yes, you will. So, in summary, you're not going to resolve this issue today or maybe even ever between what some of you would like to see, what others would like to see. Uh, the law is that board members need to ask questions and get answers to their questions. The, the law and the ethics is also that you delegate to the superintendent to run the school system and you are not hired as superintendent. Then there's always going to be a tension. So I just want to bring it back to the notion that this is relevant to the discussion, but this is not an attempt to deny information or dictate how information will be compiled or not compiled. This one is going to deal with that like he always has on the case by case basis. This just does it orderly, so in all fairness, you know, the central office staff knows should they drop everything they're doing today and work on this, 
or not, that's a decision that's going to be made by the superintendent. If he feels like it's going to take a lot of time and effort, it'll be a decision made by all of you. And if one of you feels like something should be looked into and the rest of you do not want the staff spending time looking into it, it's not going to be looked into. And that doesn't mean that someone's wrong, and it doesn't mean that someone's trying to prevent information from coming out. It just means the majority of the elected board does not want to look into a particular issue. So, again, the motion is all about just the simple process. Back to where we started. Because y'all can agree on that. You did that very well. Um, since we have Chris Campbell's legal opinion, I wanted to relay Lloyd Cooper, the Attorney General's legal opinion. And his opinion is that the open meetings and public records laws are to bring us towards transparency. We always want to move towards that. We want to move towards openness. We want to allow information requests as much as possible. We want it to be, you know, always moving towards openness. This procedure you've outlined is moving towards closedness, that's the word. Um, it is not moving towards openness. And I openness. don't think the procedure in any way affects what he's saying about the openness of government. All this is, is who are you going to direct your question to? It's that simple. So now I don't think it It's directing it to the gatekeeper. Right. It's a legal matter, but your opinion is, is My is opinion. Certain. Is Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I'm not disagreeing this with you. This procedure creates say he's talking the concept of the gatekeeper and uh, that, that is uh, completely opposite to the intention of the open meetings law and public records law and it's something I totally cannot support uh, because it's, it's not fair in my constituents. Why are you opposed to sending any request to Dr. Paul? I already try to do that as a courtesy. Now there may be times when I accidentally leave him off as a copy um, and that's just I can't you know, imagine you problem. accidentally leaving the superintendent off as a copy. It can happen. You know, sometimes you're in a hurry when your kid wants to use the computer and you push the send button. But, um, but why would you be sending the request? I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand. I hear, what, I hear you saying something different than what you sound like the reality was. I hear you saying your intent is to send it to him, and yet your first two is not to him. It is to someone else. And I discussed it with him. I said, can I put you in the copy? And he has told me yes. But I could copy him and put it to someone else. Well, all right, this is a board procedure that we can vote on. You can vote yes or no. And, and, um, but I think it's important, talking about openness, that in, you know, when anytime there's an email or something that goes along the lines of accusations against the school system or school employee, those things should be shared with the superintendent also. Would you agree? Sure. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just trying to, do you understand the, the issue if, if you ask Mary Parker for a bunch of information? I mean, do you understand his first uh, first description of one's really quick, easy to get, and the other takes we, five days to complete? Do you, are you, or do you want the power to be able to have Mary do the five days? I don't work? think, I have never asked anyone to or do that much hours. work. Or 20, or 20 hours. <laughs> um, or 20 questions hours. I ask are to clarify uh, you, issues on our agenda you want, and voting on. Do you want the power to directly ask Mary Parker to do 20 hours of work? Is that the, I is that the rub? I think that's not relevant because I've just asked questions. I haven't asked people to compile data in new formats that didn't previously yeah, exist. Yeah. One more there would be more than a push of a button. If the question takes 20 hours to respond to, do you, are you frustrated because you don't have the power to ask Mary to ask No, do that? of course not. Um, I would expect an employee to say, well, look, this entails more work than you probably realize, you know, and that sort of thing, that communication process. Yeah, that's good. All right, um, and so one amendment to the motion uh, is that we're dealing with uh, information that's asked from the central office. If you want to call the principal and ask a question, that's certainly. The original mover and second to accept that amendment? Yes. Yeah. I don't do it. Yeah. Well, I have to go back. Steve said yes. I think I, I second. Chip yeah. made the motion. That's right, Chip. Chip okay. has to okay. second. So, yeah. This is an amendment to the motion today, so you're the you're the member. Yeah. So you accept the amendment. You're okay with that amendment. Correct. Yes. Thank you. It is. Is it appropriate for our attorney to make a motion in a board meeting? He didn't make He's the motion. He's not elected. He didn't make the motion. Well, he read it to us. He made. I mean, he wrote the motion, and then somebody decided to make it. That is appropriate. Yes. Okay. That's true. Yeah. 
Okay. And all I did was take the thoughts of the superintendent for y'all to consider. It didn't have to be a motion, but Mr. Craig chose it to be a motion. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Okay. Okay. Consent agenda. I have a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. So moved. I'm oh, sorry. Go Is there ahead. a second? Second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Ms. Baldwin, I'll give you a couple minutes to talk about your sheets. Thank you. Um, the gray folder, is, like I mentioned, is what I received at the Board of uh, uh, Yes. I, I have a feeling I'm going to hit an uh, area where I'm going to drop the call, but since we've gone through all the action items, I'm going to, um, okay. I will not call back in. All right. I think I can hang up on you. Okay. All right. Yeah, <laughs> <I think so. laughs> all right. Thank you. <laughs> I'll put a packet together for Steve as well because he shouldn't be here. Um, right, if you go to probably the back of the right side of the folder, there's a, uh, a handout that like this. It's called the Data Decision Making Cycle Questions School Boards Should Ask. So, Who is the Center for Public Education? Uh, Patty Bart is the director, and she did the presentation at the school board meeting. Um, in fact, the North Carolina School Board Association is partnering with her. Uh, so this is, and this is their, her group. This is their paperwork. And you'll this is find, kind of school board association. Right. You'll find her contact information on the very back page of the PowerPoint. It's called Data First. Uh, she has two websites, but it's the Center for Public Education. It's at the top of the letterhead and uh, this is datafirst.org. Uh, but there's something in the works right now with the School Board Association to have a partnership with uh, Patty Barnes and her group. So I just wanted to make you aware the types of questions school boards should be asking for, the baseline data information, <coughs> uh, et cetera, student outcomes, all those questions. Uh, the other information I did get from the Wake County School Board <coughs> and I, we were talking about the large sheet is called the Healthy Schools Report, and it gives you a snapshot um, of every, give us a snapshot of every school in Buckham County, uh, whether the, the school is overcrowded, under enrolled. Uh, it gives you not only that facilities data, a time frame if there's going to be renovations. It gives you the technology the school has. The lab, they have a you know computer labs, laptops. Uh, it gives you demographic data on the students, the number receiving and percent receiving free and reduced lunch. Uh, so it, it's a great tool for decision making. Uh, it goes on across the top is where they have each school listed. Uh, but this is what I was talking about when I said a data dashboard uh, at the last meeting, that we would have this type of information at our fingertips basically uh, to make informed decisions. I mean, right now we have some serious concerns and some Ms. serious Baldwin, problems. With just present family. that as is. Okay. Um, the other information I gave you, these are actually, these are, they're white, white sheets I gave you, but they're really green in the Wake County system. It's sort of a fact sheet. It gives you a synopsis of what you're voting on, on your agenda, and they actually give these out as a work session. They hold a work session uh, the day of their actual, their regular school board meeting. And, uh, you know, I brought up work sessions would be helpful problem. for us. Okay. <laughs> so, what I like about this is they give you the topic first. Then they tell you uh, the person in the central office, the liaison person, the department chair, or whoever, that's responsible for this. And the one example... Uh, the single sheet is GPS system for their school buses. So then they give you a background. They give you a one paragraph or sometimes it's just a couple sentence uh, summary of what this is all about. Then they give you the fiscal implication. So how much is this going to cost the school system? So they give you that information and then they give you the savings. If this is going to in turn investing in this GPS system, uh, are there some cost savings to be realized? Uh, from doing this system. So, and then they give you what their recommendation is and uh, what that liaison person. So, this is just a one-pager uh, that really breaks down 
the agenda items and what you'll be voting on and, and gives you another snapshot of what you need to know. You need to know if there's a cost to it. You need to know if it's actually going to end up saving the school system money. Um, the other, uh, what was a green sheet again with Wake County, another fact sheet. And this is one I brought up because it's very similar to something we're doing right now in Buncombe County with the STEM high school. But they want a career and technical high school. So they're asking for board approval to develop this program, to develop a model for this uh, CTE high school. And I think this is something we could, could look at if we have not given approval to look Ms. at Baldwin, this. High we're not discussing that. Okay. So I just wanted uh, to give you this information. I hope, my hope is that when, should we set a time that maybe we can talk about these data formats if we want to request this from our school system? Oh, this is, would that be appropriate? Well, as I said, we might be having a work session sometime either in August or September. Okay. Maybe we can discuss it at that time. Okay. Yeah. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Next board meeting is on the second. Yes, sir. Um, Hear the music playing already. Do you want my music? Uh, 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 Go for it. Go for it. Are you doing this for Well, I'm a plug in a chuggy. Are you out causing trouble? Yes, sir. Are you doing this? I'm going to use your camera. I know. I don't know this, man. Don't worry. Do you know me at Squirt? Well, they said it wasn't a tax. Well, you can, you can thank the gay Republican for it. You know, the head of the Supreme Court, what is he? She's just, he's gay. You know what I thought when they said that it was a tax? Uh-huh. Well, that's what they said. 
Waco, Texas, the home of Dr. Pepper. Oh! I love that. I like RC Cola. I like their They taste very similar. Well, there, there's hope, Dave. We can disagree on the Supreme Court, but we did, we agree on uh, Buckle County. So there's hope in this world. Believe, you better believe it. I pretty much killed myself. I tried to cook some cactus. Really? Because I heard they can do anything. You know. Yeah. Don't know the special thing. I found out printer died. No, I Bless your heart. And in this age that we live in, you know, it might be it might be a lot, but. Um, yeah, I'm thinking, you know, you see, uh, uh, yeah, certain yeah, kind of read out and stuff like that, you said, so much of money. Perhaps, you know, these books could be shared um, electronically, you know, um, on a flash drive. Or guess what? All the information that you would want would be on a flash drive that then you could, you could take home and ask it to come to you in any kind of what they do with that. You see what, Connie, you know, it's a what would they do with that? You couldn't, they couldn't even answer the darn phone. <laughs> well, that's true. And that's the guy running the show. But anyway, that would, that would seem, that would seem to be.